Okay, so good morning and welcome everyone to another webinar presented by the Permanent Office of Navarre to the European Union. And let me introduce the topic of today's webinar on the context of the European Green Week Exchange of Good Regional Practices on Water Resilience. To begin, Anna Oyo, our second Vice President, Regional Minister for Memory, External Action and Basque of the Government of Navarra, will officially open the event. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much, Maria, and good morning. Once again, the European Green Week has come around. If we want a better future, it should be sustainable. What is at the stakes combating climate change and offsetting its negative effects? Within this challenge, water management is a key factor. For this reason, we are going to dedicate the present days to sharing and debating good water management practices. Our regions all have a lot of to say in the matter, as confirmed by the working document issued by the Committee of these Regions titled Towards a Resilient Water Management to Fight Climate Crisis Without, Within a Blue Oil, which is expected to be approved in June. There's no doubt that water suffers the effect of climate changes, agriculture, industrialization, and urbanization. Our action has consequences. Furthermore, drought, flooding, and extreme change in the water are increasingly widespread and have efforts in terms of social and territorial cohesion. Water is an issue that we will strategic in the 20th, 21th century from all perspectives, the economy, healthcare, social affairs, and other levels. In Europe, we need to plan a water strategy that can be approached from a perspective of cover governance at different levels. Local and regional authorities have a key role to play because they are the ones closest to the land, lands that are often cross borders, which means that cooperation between different territories, river basins, and mountain areas is what well required. In this way, Green Europe connects with Blue Europe, and it does so from different angles, such as the circular economy, digitalization, research, or raising awareness. This is why the seminar will bring together a range of innovative or successful experience in different fields from Nouvelle Aquitaine, Loya Saxony, and Navarra with the last name became Abel, uh, able to call on contribution from NILSA and the Life Nadapta project. Before this experience are presented, we will hear from Johanna Cabaret, Nouvelle Aquitaine, and Daniel Gardes, Oldenburg, to whom I would like to hand over in that order. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Anna. Now let's proceed with the regions. The first speaker, Joanna Cabaret, that will inspire us with a European project featuring native-based solutions from her region, Nouvelle Aquitaine. Thank you, Johanna. Yes, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. There we are. So um, I'm going to present the Embracer project, which is a nature-based solutions for Atlantic Regional Climate Resilience Project. So just some very quickly information of the project. So we answered to uh, Horizon Mission 22 um, last year. I mean, it started last year. So it's going to have a lifespan of four years from October last year, uh, last year, 2023, until September, October, 2027, with a total budget of around 18 million euros. And it is to accelerate the transformation towards climate resilient regions. And why regions? Because this is um, an environment that, that allows to nature-based solutions to, uh, to get deployed and the idea of this project is to have the collaboration between the institute, so researchers institute, but also the government, the private sector, the society, and also Embracer aims to have 
projects that could help this regions in the whole consortium to get more ideas from each other in order to get a better adaptation and mitigation to climate change using nature-based solutions. So this project is based on three landscapes. So we have marine and coastal landscape, urban landscape, and rural landscapes. It is, as I said, it is for the Atlantic regions. So we have some regions that are demonstrating regions. So we have from, we have Porto in Portugal, the region of Cantabria in Spain, central Denmark in Denmark, the nouvelle aquitaine region from, from France, and the West Flanders for Belgium. And this is the demonstrating regions. So we have several projects for the demonstrating regions and the replicating regions. So it's also in Portugal, but this time in the Cavado region, the West Flanders region in Belgium, and the Friesland region in the Netherlands. So in nouvelle aquitaine we have two demonstrators. The first one is the Marais de Poitvin. So this is a region, as you can see here in the map, uh, this, this greener part, and is located between two regions, the Pays de la Loire and the nouvelle aquitaine region. And this is a very important wetland on the French Atlantic coast. It has around 150 kilometers of coastline, but also it's a Ramsar site. So that shows the uh, the importance of, of this, this space. And it has a remarkable nature uh, natural heritage with many species on birds, mammals, uh, dragonflies, butterflies, fishes, amphibians, and also plants. So the idea with this project is, I mean, with this part of the demonstrator is the restoration of river morphology through uh, the sedimentary recharge. So the idea as many places in the world, the idea was to drain out all the regions and having um, water courses that were very straight. So the idea is to re-give the meanders to, to these rivers. And in order to be able to do that, uh, we install mineral banks, as we can see here, in, in order to create again, this curvy in, in the rivers. And that allows to restore the river dynamics, restore part of the hydro systems. And we can we have already seen in, in this region that the changes have already allowed fishes to regain this area, fishes that they were very in, in lower population. And now the river is showing that this population of fish are regaining territory. And with the Embracer project, that is to see what is the impact of these changes, these superficial changes into the water table. Is it that these superficial changes allowed water to stay longer time on, on the water table? So we don't know yet. So that is the idea with the Embracer project. So we can see here some examples of what it was before. So we see that uh, the water course was almost non-existent before, and then we had to uh, clean it up and we can see that there's more continuity on water. And the other side, we can see the banks that were a little bit inexistent and the idea was to regain uh, some meanders form. And for the second one, the, the it's along the Garonne River, which is a river that starts in the Pyrenees and goes up to the stir of the Gironde estuary. And the length is 487 kilometers. So we have with this, uh, with this river, we can see that um, by 2030, there is a decrease of natural flow in the Garonne River between 13 and 32%. And it's going to be higher in the Pyrenees region. And this is mainly because uh, there's going to be less snowfall in the Pyrenees that will dry out a little bit the region. And the recharge of the ground water is going to be lower. And to all that, we add the constantly raising of temperatures due to climate change. So the, this Ramage project started in 2019, and we're going to continue some parts with the Embracer project. So it's the, the Ramage project is part of the Embracer project. And the idea is to um, 
stored the snow melts during uh, during poor winter recharge seasons in the in the channels next to the Gavron River and be able to release them into the lower seasons for um, having more volume of, of water into the river. So that is how it works. So we have here the, the river and the idea is to uh, store the water here in the channels and be able to do it when we have high water periods and then release them in the lower periods in order to have uh, more water that goes to, to the river. And this is going to be important because in summer, the river can have temperatures between 26 and 30 degrees. And the water that comes from the water table is about 13 to 16 degrees. So we are going to have a, an important dilution in temperature, but also in, in, uh, in matter that is in sediments that are in the water. And that is going to have an effect into fish population, but also human population, because this river uh, goes through a bigger city that is called Toulouse. So it's going to have um, an impact also on, on society. Here we can have some um, information from the newspapers. I mean, some um, uh, some citizens that were not happy having uh, the river modified because as it was this year, it was a, a wet season. The season was quite, a, we had a lot of water. So there were some little floodings. There were not many, but there were some little floodings and people thought that these changes that were made in the river caused the flooding. So um, that is why it is important to have a social acceptability that uh, we can keep the population informed, uh, show the changes that had been done on site and having consulting meetings. So in order to have people um, more informed about what is going on and be able to accept what the changes are going to be and actually that nature-based solutions are going to be a good thing uh, for, uh, for the whole environment, for also for the society. So um, this part of social acceptability is very important to have it in mind. And it's, we're going to deploy them uh, into the Embracer project. So here's just to have a, a wide vision of all the partners that, that are in, in the Embracer project of the six countries. So this is a, a good thing because we have a lot of exchanges with, with all of them and, and the good groups are being built in. And just because I talk about the, uh, the Pyrenees, um, the Nouvelle Aquitaine region is also working with another uh, European project. In this case, it's a life project that is uh, coordinated by the OPCC, which is the Pyrenean Observatory on Climate Change. And the, Pyrene and the project is called Pyrenees for Clima. And one of the work packages is, talks about water uh, availability. So the Nouvelle Team is going to be also involved in this project that also started last year, but it's a little bit slower in the functioning, but it's going to work as well. And the idea is to, to keep on working on, on water management. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for your time. We cannot hear you, Maria. Sorry. Thank you very much, Ivana Wasseyin, um, for showing us your interesting project in Nouvelle Aquitaine. Let's move on now to Navarra, now with Javier Loizu from Navarra Administration of the Water, who will discuss the local management of flood risk in Navarra. Thank you, Javier. You can see it, right? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, as you said, I work in... Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this event. I work in the Environmental Management of Navarra, which is a public company of the government of Navarra. And I wanted to talk today about these five, five points, which I thought were they are interested. First, I want to explain what is this LifeNAPTA project we've been working on in the last years. Then I'll uh, talk about the flood risk in Navarra, what has happened here in the last few years. Then I'll give some details on the regional flood risk management plan of Navarra. 
And the two main points I wanted to discuss today are the local plans, which are managed by municipalities and we have developed in the last years. And the last point will be the web and app-based management of flood, flood emergency plans, what the municipalities are doing to manage those, those plans. So, as I said, we, in the last uh, few years, we've been working on this uh, live project, which has a, as an objective to increase the resilience to climate change of our whole region, Navarra region. We started working on this project in 2017, and we will finish the project next year. And the actions of this project are grouped in, into uh, six different areas, which include uh, forestry, agriculture, health, uh, climate change monitoring. And we are specifically working on the adaptive uh, management of water, which includes uh, seven water-related actions. And I wanted to mention that the, we are working on a quite interesting action, which is we are studying the climate change impact on water resources management in Navarra. This is an interesting action that I'm not going to explain today that I wanted to mention. And then we are working also on two uh, actions involving flood protection. Uh, one of them is the development of these uh, local management plans. So I'll give some uh, details on the hydrography, uh, hydrography and climate of Navarra. Uh, some of you, of course, you know, but some others not. We 90% of our area belongs to the Ebro catchment. Our, the remaining part, the remaining 10% belongs to the Cantabrian catchment, which is located in the northern part of Navarra. And I wanted to mention also that uh, we have a very large variability, uh, climate uh, variability within our region. Well, we get up to 2,500 millimeters per year of rainfall in the northern parts. In the southern part, we only get uh, less than 500 uh, millimeters per year, and the southern part of our region is characterized by an, an intense uh, Mediterranean climate. As you see in the figure, uh, the main river we have here is the Ebro River that defines the southern border of Navarra. Now, as I said, I will show you some examples of flood events that we have here in the last uh, years. This happened 11 years, uh, 11 years ago here in, in, in the city in Pamplona, as you can see, located in central Navarra. This is another example of flood that uh, took place one year later in uh, 2014 in the northern part. We, in this town of Elizondo, they have this uh, severe storm in, that took place in July. Some of uh, some other examples of floods that we've had in the last years include this one af that affected the southern part of Navarra in the next year, in 2015. Some examples that some of you uh, probably remember, this flood that uh, affected uh, central uh, some municipalities in central Navarra in, uh, a few years later. This, uh, this one, took place in December uh, 2021, and most of the towns and cities and villages of Navarra were affected because we have uh, we had problems everywhere. These are a couple of pictures of a city in the north and a, some other city in central Navarra. And uh, just to finish with these examples, these are a couple of examples of convective events affecting uh, small catchments. This, both events took place last year in uh, a town in the north and a, and, a, and a different town in the in the southern part of Navarra in May and July. So these are quite of the example of flood events that we have in uh, Navarra in the last years. Now, uh, here in Navarra, we have a regional flood risk management plan, which is managed by the civil protection service of the government. And in this, in this document, it, it is defined with, which are the 50 municipalities that have the obligation of having a local flood risk management plan. It is also defined here in this regional plan that four other municipalities have the recommendation of having a regional plan. And in this regional plan, it is also defined the structure of the local plans, how are these, uh, how these uh, local plans have to be developed and implemented. What you can see there in the in the left, 
that was the situation just a few years ago. In 2017, in Navarra, only five municipalities had a plan uh, for managing their flood risk. That was the situation of a few years ago. Only five municipalities had their plan. And now 45 municipalities, they already have this type of plans on how to manage the flood risk when the, a flood is going to happen in their municipalities. And as you can see, it highlighted with a, a light green color, 17 of those new plans have been done thanks to the financial support of this uh, European Adapta Life project. So I think the situation has improved a lot in the last years. As I said, these uh, local plans, they have to be structured into uh, four different documents. And I think the most important uh, points are included in the fourth document. And I choose this for those four ideas to mention today about the, the main the main characteristics of those plans. First, I wanted to say that thanks to this, this type of organization, every local plan to manage flood risk in Navarra is organized in the same way. All the municipalities ha have a plan that uh, includes uh, a pre-emergency level and four different emergency levels. Uh, depending on the risk, they will activate these uh, different emergency levels. What we do uh, when we are the, uh, implementing, developing the plans, is we define thresholds. We define a stream flow or accumulated rainfall thresholds. Once uh, each of those of those thresholds are reached, the em different emergency levels have to be activated. What we include and we do we do uh, with these plans is we define actions. Every action that has to be done in each emergency level we define, and each action is assigned to a responsible group. Which are the those responsible groups? Mayors, local politicians, local police, and municipality workers are the, the are the ones that manage this, uh, these local plans. And the last point I want to, to discuss and explain today is the web-based, app-based, the computer-based tools to manage this uh, type of uh, this type this type of plans. We have developed web-based and apps to ma so the local technicians, local mayors, local politicians, policemen can manage these uh, these plans from their computers and from their cell phones. What you can see here is the web-based management tool. This is an example, a real one that we developed for a town close here close to Pamplona. This is the web-based tool we developed for the municipality of Burrada. And this uh, type of tools allow uh, managers of the plans to receive real-time stream flow and rainfall data. Uh, through these tools, managers can also activate the different emergency levels. And as you can see there, in the map, there are red points and green points. Actions can be monitored and checked. These actions we define that has to have to be done in the different emergency levels. They can be checked through these uh, websites, through these tools, whether they are already done or not. And this uh, tool has also a GIS map. So pol uh, policemen, politicians can check that the if these actions are already uh, being done or not. As I said, this is a real example of a, a tool that we developed for the municipality of Urlada. And that photograph you can see down there, this is a recent uh, application of the plan. That photograph is a parking lot closed in Burlada according to the plan in February 2024, this year. All the cars, as it was planned in the, in the plan, uh, were removed from that, from that parking lot in time so the flood didn't reach the, the cars that were parked in that uh, parking lot. This is a recent example of a plan application that really uh, worked really fine. So as I said, we develop web-based tools and app tools. Through. So in that way, the especially local mayors can manage their plan from their cell phones. Both web and app-based tool and app, and app work fully synchronized. So when a policeman closes some street in some area of the municipality, everyone, everybody else working on that plan uh, uh, re uh, receives that information at, the, at that real time. Similarly to the web-based tool in the app, 
data, real-time data are received, emergency levels can be activated, and the actions can be monitored. And I think it's very important to mention this. From both devices, very easily, local authorities can send warning SMS alerts to the population, which I think is one of the main characteristics that make this type of tools interesting. And once we develop the plans and once we implemented these tools, once we implement these tools, we carry out the fashion sessions. We invite local population so they get all the information about we, what we've done with these plans, these tools, and, this, uh, and we give them also a general overview of the project. We tell them about the specific websites that, websites that we develop for each of the municipalities. And in those uh, websites, they can find the, the whole information about the plan. Every, every one from the municipality, a local population can reach and read uh, the plan, know what was the plan about, what information is included in the plan. And population, this is important, can subscribe to the SMS warning system. And I wanted to, this is a couple of, those are a couple of photographs, photographs of a diffusion session we did in a municipality. And I wanted to finish with this number. Uh, 96,000 inhabitants of Navarra, now they live in a municipality that has this type of new warning system, which I think is interesting to give this number. So almost 100,000 people in Navarra now, they can get an SMS warning when the, there is a flood risk in their municipality. And that's uh, what I wanted to explain today. Well, so thank you very much, Javier, for sharing with us examples of lots in Navarra and how to solve them with the action from different organizations and new tools in Navarra. Let's move forward to Daniel Gerdes, project manager at the Regional Water Management Agency of Oldenburg, that will share us in insights of uh, on a local pilot action focused on optimizing rainwater use. Thank you, Daniel. Perfect, thank you for the introduction. Can you see the screen that I'm sharing? Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I was asked to give um, a little bit of an overview of uh, local pilot actions that we have in our region in Northwestern Germany with regards to optimizing uh, the use of rainwater. Um, I'm a project manager and already got an introduction, so I'm gonna skip. Skip this slide. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the company that I work for, uh, how we deal with very heavy uh, rainwater events, and also speak a little bit about a DeCiso uh, project, which is a Horizon project that we are now, uh, I think, a little bit over a year working on, um, also with regards to uh, rainwater. Um, the company I work for, as I said, is situated in northwestern Germany. Uh, we have a very varied uh, area that we service. We have uh, water and wastewater uh, services that we provide. Uh, as you can see on the picture, we have a few uh, islands close to the coast. We have a coastal line. We have tidal areas. We have a, a big river uh, that flows through the, the area that we are responsible for. And as such, we of course have different kinds of challenges with regards to drinking water, but also with regards to uh, wastewater services. Um, we have seen over the last couple of years that uh, water demand um, in our region has increased significantly. Um, even the figure on this uh, slide today is not is not even accurate anymore. We're closing in on um, 90 million cubes per year that we need to provide to uh, the people in our region, um, which is really pushing it to to a limit. Um, the increase was mainly a result of a population increase. Uh, we have uh, new uh, industries settling in our region because of uh, the accessibility of harbors, but also already existing industries that are expanding their activities. 
in addition to those two factors, we also have agriculture and we see that a lot of already existing farms are now switching from their own groundwater resources to connecting to the drinking water uh, system and um, consuming the water that we produce, resulting in, as I said, a higher water demand for the region. Um, above all of this, of course, climate change is, is a big factor um, also in our region. Uh, sea level rise, salinization in coastal regions, um, dry spells during the summer, and uh, the topic of today, heavy rainwater, uh, heavy rain events are, are also an issue for us. Um, how do we deal with these events? Um, we have a few uh, urban areas in our region where we experience a lot of flooding, uh, as my, the previous speaker already uh, has shown. Um, which then results in a, a lot of um, yeah, urban flooding, uh, which is sometimes enjoyed, as you can see on the left picture, where somebody's canoeing along uh, the river. But most of the time, this actually causes a lot of issues. Um, one of the ways we deal with this is through a lot of um, different kinds of projects uh, where for example, here we were part of an interact project called Catch, where we worked together with 12 partners um, that all um, had a, a partnering city. We had the city of Oldenburg um, working towards the strategies for adapting to climate change. An example of a project output that we created through this project was that by a lot of uh, yeah, conducting a lot of workshops, we gathered information from citizens, information from people that work at the city, and also information from uh, technical experts from our own company, uh, but also from other um, institutes that are quite knowledgeable on the field of um, rainwater management. And one of the outputs in the project was uh, the picture you can see on the left side of the screen um, is a map where the city is now um, um, map to indicate where we have an experience uh, flooding events during certain types of uh, rain events. So it is a classification system, uh, not only the depth, but also um, the type of rain event that would cause such a flooding event to happen. Um, this then was used as a tool by the municipality to um, create retention basins, which you can see on the bottom right picture. So it's actively used now in city planning activities. Um, and on the other side, it's also used, of course, by um, citizens in the town to better understand what will happen if we are going to experience another heavy rainwater event. So this was one project output. The other project result was um, that we introduced a, a traffic management system that is completely automated. We had a, a difficult area in the southern part um, of the city, which is depicted on the left side. Um, there are a lot of um, um, you know, motorways uh, that cannot really be adjusted. There's no space for retention basins. There's not really... Um, yeah, uh, an option to increase sewage sizes because it's at a very low level in the system, so it would flood anyway. Um, and because of this, we decided to implement a, a traffic management system where we have sensors in the sewage system that um, operate um, um, yeah, active um, traffic signs that flip over, then close a certain street for a certain period of time that the flooding is taking place and then switch back and open the, um, the streets again when the water level has receded enough. So this is one of the uh, um, yeah, bigger projects that we do with uh, different types of, of actions trying to deal with uh, rainwater, heavy rainwater events in, in urban areas. Another project where uh, we try to really work on awareness. Um, I think was already um, one of the topics by the previous speakers, really talk with the people, um, um, involve them in projects is the SWAT project. Here we developed an app um, of an intelligent or a, a smart water tank, which is essentially a big bucket that's connected to the roof. It collects the water and allows the sewage, uh, sewage system to have a little bit more of a retention time, uh, so more capacities in the sewers. The idea here was that the app uh, is linked to weather data and 
will empty um, these water tanks ahead of a rain event taking place, allowing us to have a bigger capacity of storing rainwater in an urban, uh, urban area. Uh, this is what it looks like in the app. Um, but besides of creating more of a retention uh, time uh, with regards to the rainwater going into the sewage, it's also been a project where we have been actively working with um, well, young people, but also with homeowners. Uh, we participated with the universities as well to uh, get a better grip and get a better understanding uh, what it actually means uh, to deal with these heavy rainwater uh, events and also what uh, citizens themselves can do. Um, yeah, we're quite happy actually about this project. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about to you was the CISO. Uh, the CISO is a project, as I said, funded by uh, Horizon. It's a coordination and support project in Horizon, not your classical um, research project. We are uh, working with a multitude of partners here um, and we represent one of the the orange um, pilot uh, cases in the project. Um, in the project, we are trying to um, yeah, induce investment in circular economy initiatives. Uh, there are four different themes in this project, uh, but we are the one that is representing rainwater harvesting um, for our region. Um, we defined a few goals uh, that in the project we want to network with more stakeholders. We want to identify new potentials for um, creating new business cases with regards to rainwater harvesting. We want to identify and maybe also ourselves develop financing schemes, which has often been identified as an issue for not being able to implement new measures, especially with regards to rainwater management. Um, and the last point, uh, which is more or less the more important point for us, is to develop a more structured approach to these project development activities. We've, these projects normally are initiated more or less um, spontaneously, but through the DECISA project, we have now to find a more structured approach to business uh, project developments, sorry, um, and also have a, a better uh, company internal structure for delivering these projects. Um, and during the DECISA project, we've implemented this system and now uh, through or uh, during the project have also successfully secured uh, three grant funded projects that also focus on different aspects of rainwater harvesting. Uh, one pilot is looking at um, um, yeah, researching whether rainwater can be an alternative resource for hydrogen production, uh, which is going to be built in our region. Um, the second pilot is that we are now actively working with uh, big water consumers in our region, industrial clients, uh, to make fit for purpose uh, solutions. So really, um, deliver a specialized type of water that they can use for their production processes instead of using drinking water for their um, production process. And the last one is to develop a digital twin where um, we can simulate for certain areas in our, um, um, yeah, in our service area um, where we can simulate how certain um, implementations will result in a reduced runoff or a better controlled runoff before implementing these in the real world. That was my last slide. Thank you for your attention. And I'll hand over to the next speaker. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, for introducing the main objective from your company regarding the consequences of the rainwater and how to reuse it. Um, now we are arriving to our last, but not least, at least, Jairo Gomez from Nilsa Navar, who will address the topic of the digitalization in the urban water cycle. Thank you. Jairo, we cannot hear you.
Yes, sorry, one moment. I have problem now with my presentation, but. Don't worry, we have time enough. Yes. Now you can see my presentation. It's okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Maria. The first thing uh, I would like to do is to thank the organization of the event uh, for the possibility of being here today. Um, so good morning to everybody. I am Jairo Gómez, responsible for research, development, and innovation in Navarra de Infraestructuras Locales, or NILSA. Mm. And I'm going to present a brief summary of the event that took place yesterday in a conference on digitalization in the integral water cycle that we held yesterday uh, in Tudela, in Navarra, in collaboration with the Public University of Navarra. NILSA is the public company attached to the government of Navarra, whose objective is the sanitation of the rivers of the region. To achieve this purpose, uh, we manage the sanitation fee for the construction, uh, operation and maintenance of the uh, urban wastewater treatment plants in Navarra. In this way, the 99% of the population is served and there are more than 200 uh, treatment plants. The research, develop, development and innovation area is established as a strategic and transversal line in NILSA to take care some of the challenges that uh, are facing in this sector, such as the recovery of nutrients, the removal of emerging pollutants, or the energy efficiency uh, of wastewater treatment. And with the idea of uniting the research part of the company uh, and, uh, and that of the university, the local sustainability uh, collaboration between the public university of Navarra and Nilsa was created three years ago, where academic internships and dissemination activities on issues of common interest and our market. Uh, an example of these activities was the conference on digitalization in the water sector that took place yesterday, 30 of May, at the uh, public university campus in Tudela. Digitalization is the use of technology and digital data to achieve set business process improvements. The main objective of this conference was to show how digitalization has reached the field of the, uh, urban, of the urban water cycle and to highlight the advances, tools and technologies currently available and where these lines of work seems to be heading. These conferences are co-organized between the NILSA and the university and the LIFE project, the LIFE NADAPTA project. This, this project, NADAPTA, as Javier has explained, is an integrated project implemented in the whole uh, region of Navarra. In this slide, we can see the schedule of the conferences. The first part of the conference showed, uh, showed uh, in a general way, way how digitalization is understood in the entities of Navarra, NILSA, and Servicios de la Comarca de Pamplona, which is in charge of the integral water cycle of the area of Pamplona, that includes the largest, the largest uh, population of Navarra. First, Roberto Fernández, Operation and, and Maintenance Director in, in NILSA, explained some of the equipment inst installed in recent years and the main advantages it has brought to the company. Uh, an example uh, is the sensors that uh, have been placed in, in treatment plants and collectors for the control of water quality, water flows, and overflows. On the other hand, a review was made of all the software tools and platforms that we have developed during the history of NILSA. Uh, from the first remote control a long time ago to the current, uh, to the, uh, current programs uh, for the management uh, or, faci or facili of facilities and equipments or the prediction of the water flows by means of uh, artificial intelligence. Then Javier Orcada, the director of the uh, Integral Water Cycle Service in Servicios de la Comarca de Pamplona showed, it, showed uh, its experience after 40 years of digitalization in the Integral Water Cycle. Since the 80s, when in 1984 they created their first SCADA, when the word digitalization did not exist yet. 
Today, 40 years later, they have installed an expert system for planning and management uh, of drinking water networks that allow the rapid detection of leaks and the planning of the renewal of networks. Next, the vision of the university on this topic was presented by Miquel Ferrero. First of all, some of the most commonly used terms in this field, uh, field were described in a simple and, theor and theoretical way, and it was explained what digital transformation, transformation is and what it is not. Digitalization is a social, cultural, and business phenomenon. It was uh, descri described what a digital twin is and how an anomaly detection works. Finally, some examples of usefulness in different fields and topics were shown. After the coffee, space, space were, uh, was given to the main projects in Navarra that uh, have allowed the implementation of tools and technologies to digitalize the water treatment processes. Specifically, our colleague, colleague uh, Maite Zarranz presented the Live Nadarta project whose main objective is to establish strategy, strategies for the adaptation and mitigation of climate change in Navarra. Within the areas of action in which Navarra has participated, it has been possible to establish a large number of sensors for the detection of overflows and currents of interest in the uh, uh, largest wastewater treatment plants. Some of this equipment was visited in the afternoon at the Tudela Wastewater Treatment Plant. In addition, the work done on the modeling of three clean filters or the measurement of water quality by image uh, processing and artificial uh, intelligence uh, were, were presented. On the other hand, myself presented the PERTE project Agual Digital Navarra, or ADNA, that covers the digitalization of all the area of Navarra as a budget of 11 million euros and among the objectives of uh, uh, to be achieved, uh, the, mat the mathematical models and digital twins of the water and sludge treatment processes in the four uh, large, bigger wastewater treatment plants uh, stand out. This will be this will make it possible to adjust, optimize, and verify some of the stages of the biological treatment, reducing energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. This project is carried out by, by, the by the consortium of NILSA, Comunidad de la Comarca de Pamplona, and Mancomunidad de Montejurra. Uh, in the last part, uh, another overview of the digital digitalization of the water sector is shown. In this case, the national vision in Spain, inviting from the Spanish Association of Water Supply and Sanitation, or AES, to Alberto González, uh, who is the coordinator of a subgroup on Building Information Modeling, or BIM, and Digital Transformation. The Digital Transformation subgroup is working on analyzing the needs and creating a governance model and a roadmap for the change of philosophy that means digital transformation. Digital enabling technologies are defined as, tool, as tools for change. Regarding the BIM subgroup, it was explained what BIM is and the advantages of its implementation, both in the area of, the, of projects and in the area of operation of wastewater management facilities. And finally, Jaime Flores, Subdirector of Investment Development and Innovation of an entity of great prestige as Canal de Isabel II, which manages the integral water cycle in the community of Madrid, shows his perspective and experience in the in this field of digitalization. He emphasized a lot uh, the necessary work on the data obtained on a daily uh, basis. They have a pipe renewal plan based on a digital tool uh, that have algorithms uh, that uh, the algorithms work out which pipe uh, which pipe to re to renovate. In addition, they analyze isolated weak sections. They work with modeling of uh, reservoir inflow inflows by means of uh, neuronal networks. They have implemented a system for the decision of energy management. So, so, since the water sector generates a lot of energy, but also consumes a lot. And finally, he shows us the mathematical model of their supply network uh, and its simulation based on different scenarios. 
after comparing the interests of the different ent entities, we come to the conclusion that regardless of, of size, we, we all have the same needs in the dig digitalization of the sector. The day ends with a space uh, for questions and reflections in round table mode uh, that was very interesting. We were able to discuss the effect of the digitalization on employment or about the question of whether machine learning models would replace deterministic models or coexist with them. The presentations and recordings of the conference are uh, available for those interested in, in the YouTube channel uh, shown in the screen. We encourage you to watch the recording so that we can share, share uh, our, our experience with you. In this channel, you can also find rec recordings of other conferences on sludge, waste, or sustainable uh, urban drainage systems. And this is all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jairo, for letting us know about the use of digital activities in the water sector in Navarra. I would like to add also that we will put all your slides and the recording in our web. And now we are approaching the end of the conference. If there are any questions, please, you can type them in the chat box. As we are running out of time, I'm going to read one question um, that we have on the chat that is quite long. And here it is. It says, sensorization in the, is the first step in taking empirical decisions, integrating with actuators, and moving towards efficiency in resource management and process automation. It does not matter the political color of a municipality, but in general, it is the municipality technicians who really know and manage the resources. So the question is, how can cities develop this type of project in the medium and long term without depending on short termings of other people, um, political decisions? Now you can feel free to answer. Thank you. Well, if you will, I I would uh, try to to answer it. <laughs> uh, I believe that the best way to is to is to establish to establish a long term strategy by the technicians and ask for a funded project uh, in a national or European call for proposals. In this way, uh, even if the short term cir circumstances change, uh, there is a commitment to comply with the, with the project. Uh, today, uh, we have talked uh, here about several of these projects, no? the PERT uh, of, digital, of digitalization ADNA, the Life Pyrenees uh, has appeared and the Life Nadapta, which uh, has been running for almost uh, seven years with different governments in, in Navarra and, and has never been affected uh, uh, in its uh, route. I don't know if somebody else wants. Yeah, probably just to add a little thing, I, I think it, what is important is that regions can have a vision uh, that the past actually political uh, colors as you mentioned uh, for example in the Nuvelaquitaine region we have a roadmap that was um, established in 2019 and it was revalidated last year with ambitions and I think if programs or projects like well, in this case, Embracer, but uh, like OPCC, like I state, I like it presented, um, which is in my presentation that includes several regions like the um, community of um, working in the Pyrenees that includes Navarra, that includes uh, Nouvelle Aquitaine, that includes Occitanie, uh, that includes um, and, the Andor and, and other um uh, Spanish regions, I think if we can have projects that there are linked to this kind of uh, long-term uh, processes or long-term roadmaps, I think it's easier for the projects to have a continuity in, in sensorization of data or sharing the information as well. Uh, regarding the local plans, uh, we've been already working with different politicians, mayors for already over six years. In that time, 
um, I think most of them uh, have chains from different colors. But in general, I can say that we have a, had a very good experience and we didn't face any specific problem because the, the change of the colors or the different uh, politicians or majors, we usually uh, keep a good relation with all of them and it was not a, not, not a problem for the uh, management of the, the plan. So we're uh, quite happy about how, is, how the thing is going. Okay, so if you don't have nothing else to add, and we don't have uh, for the moment more questions, um, also you can send us an email if you have more questions and we will um, send them to the speakers. There is one question is, in yeah. the chat. About... So, um, yeah. What uh, what do you think are the suggestions to change some approach in public and private river management that don't respect the ecosystem conservation principles? Okay, so you can feel free to answer it. Well, I think um, probably um, I will leave Javier. Probably he has some some answers about the water management in in Navarra. But actually, what happens in in France is like there are syndicates for for basins, river basins, and they are um, they have a policy on water management. And um, at least here in France, there is this the use in water management is quite. Uh, ruled by different laws and different projects. So um, having not respecting the ecosystem is, uh, well, we're trying to get all the time to uh, have a, an improvement of, of the laws in order to, um, to show that a better water quality in rivers is going to be helpful for the, the entire ecosystem. So but I know that in some of the regions, this water management, it could be a little bit more complicated and how to do it in order to change a word to, um, to uh, say something against the ones that uh, don't, don't do a, a good water management. Uh, I'm not sure how to, how to do it, but I think at least here in France, we have uh, some policies that go into uh, having a, a good management and trying to, to improve it later by later. Yeah, I wanted to say here, the, um, here in Navarra, in, uh, I'm not myself working on that project, but there is a very interesting project which is called Ebro Resilience, where different administration, including the government of Navarra and, and the Ebro Water Agency, they are working all together on that project, which I think is quite interesting. It's called Ebro Resilience. And um, this that's the kind of project that nowadays we are doing here in Navarra. And that focus especially on respect the ecosystem conser conservation while doing things to reduce flood risk. But the the ecosystem conservation that is mentioned in the in the question, I think I think is something that uh, is uh, fully considered on this uh, type of new projects we, we are doing now. Okay, so as we are a bit up, out of time, I will thank you very much, Joanna, Javier, Daniel, and Jairo. I really believe it's very interesting to share these practices on water resilience and learn from different regions. And if you have nothing else to add, um, we will move on to the conclusion of the session. And for the concluding remarks, we have the intervention, the intervention sorry, of Silvia Oger, Director of the European Projects Office from the Government of Navarra. Gracias, María. Eh, buenos días a todos y a todas. Good morning, everyone. Eh, I am Silvia Oger. I am the Director of the European Project Office eh, in the Government of Navarra. And well, uh, to close this session, uh, first I would like to thank you all for your uh, attend attendance and especially, of course, to our guest speakers. 
uh, your participations uh, have been of very high interest uh, regarding this uh, issue we are tackling with today, which is resilient water management. Uh, there is no doubt that in the European Union and well, in, uh, in fact, in most of the countries, uh, water management uh, is uh, nowadays impacted by two main factors, uh, we can say. One is climate change that causes floods, uh, droughts, water scarcity, etc. And the other one is the impact of our uh, human activity, especially agriculture and industry. So therefore, uh, what we need is uh, coordinated actions uh, for uh, the mitigation, adaptation and resilience of the system. And uh, now, uh, today we have heard some very interest, interesting examples of this uh, kind of actions. Actions that uh, in these examples we, ha we have heard today are being carried out mainly at regional level uh, as it was said before, uh, regions are really uh, key actors in this in this issue. So uh, we have heard uh, interesting examples of uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, Nouvel Aquitaine uh, told us about uh, the restoration of uh, the river morphology through sediment recharge, and uh, another example of the recharge of the Garonne River. Then we have, we have learned also uh, about local plans to manage flood risk or to how to face extreme water events. And um, in, this, in this regard, we have uh, learned about uh, web-based web -based management tools and examples such as the use of rainwater for the production of hydrogen. And finally, um, we have uh, heard about the digitalization of the urban water cycle that has been uh, carried out for many years and now it is introducing innovative tools such as uh, digital twins, artificial intelligence, the installment of sensors, etc. So all these actions uh, we have learned today about and many more are the ones that should contribute to uh, reduce uh, the impact uh, on the on the management of of, of the water. Uh, I hope that all these contents have been of interest for you, and and thanks uh, once again for for attending this this webinar. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you.